Hi, everyone who's joining. If you're looking for Kocharya's coaching colloquium, you're in the right place. All right, Ram, I think we're, um, we're at 10.30, well, my yeah. time. Um, kick it off. Yeah, okay. Um, hi, we have today um, uh, two people who have done a lot of work on the cultural diversity and who are also coaches. Carol and I had worked together on uh, EMCC, European Mentoring and Coaching Council uh, project. And each of us wrote a book we were supposed to write together. We did, and then we shifted it to individual books as well. And Carol is a published author. She is a podcaster. She is a coach. She works with various institutions in Israel. Um, and she's expert in the field of cultural diversity. She's done a lot of work on that. Viviana um, is in her coaching journey at this point in time. Um, and I, I was very impressed by the fact of some of the work that she has done. She worked in the Italian army at one point in time with the UN, uh, various places, uh, very diverse kind of work that she has done. And she was the one who suggested that she would like to uh, come up with this uh, presentation on coaching uh, across cultures, cultural boundaries, diversity, and so on. And so uh, together, Carol and Viviana form a fantastic team in terms of presenting on one of probably what is the most crucial aspect of coaching, what happens when we coach across cultures, cultural boundaries, uh, mindsets are different, and there have been many, many studies done. Carol is very familiar with these various studies, how, for example, how our ethical values, moral values change across cultures and how we look at things very differently. And our lenses, our frames are very different. And therefore, there's a tremendous need to reframe and to be able to respect and understand that culture with which you are dealing with, which very, very often forget if we are steeped in our own cultural idioms and memes and so on. And we are judgmental. That is something which seriously affects the quality of coaching. So some of these issues will be covered today as we go along. Um, I saw that Viviana has done a great presentation in terms of moving through incompetencies and competencies and so on. And hopefully the audience will be sufficiently enthused to participate in this. Uh, Priya will watch this chat box and she will uh, feed back into the speakers to continue with. Uh, I'm, I seem to be having a little bit of problem in Bangalore. It's raining hard and the internet is not all that great. So I'll stay mostly off mute and off video. Uh, if necessary, I'll come in. Uh, Carol, Viviana, and Priya, to the three of you, please. Go. Okay. Viviana, you want to take the lead? Yes. Hi to everybody. Good afternoon. Good evening. Depends where you are. So I'm going to share some slides. Are you fine, Karel and Priya and Ram? We yes. can start with the slides we prepare. I think that I can share my desktop. Let's see if you can see. I think it's... Yes, very good. Very good. So we move. <laughs> um, so first of all, thank all of you for being here. And I'm Viviana Conte. Now I'm based in UK for family reasons but I will let you know more about me in two seconds. So this is the agenda we are going to propose to you. So we are going to uh, start with my experience, my first professional experience with United Nations. And then we are going to do some link with cross-cultural coaching. And um, we are going also to approach the fourth level of awareness dealing with cultural diversity and to check where we are as a coach. And then we're going also to do this magic link with coaching for competencies. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to give you more details regarding me. I'm Italian, you can understand my accent. And uh, since 2005, I more have a background in political affairs 
And um, that's why I started my first professional, uh, professional work with international organization with the uh, United Nations, NATO, Italian Army. So I moved around from Africa, Middle East, Western Europe. And uh, then I enrolled as Ram said in, with Cochoria, Cochoria training to get my PCC credential. And Priya, she's here. She's my wonderful, amazing mentor. So that's why I moved around. And then at certain point, I became really interested by to global performance because I was surrounded by very good example of leaders performing in complex scenario. That's why I really was fascinated by leadership issues and to see how these people were performing uh, uh, around the world. That's how I discovered cross-cultural coaching, but we are going to then to move in, um, in details. So we'll go, I will give you more details. But now, Karen, please introduce yourself because I know I, that you have a wonderful story. So please inspire us, okay? Okay, uh, you know, you have a, a, an amazing story about the journey that you've gone through. I've gone through a totally different journey, and I think that's what makes this so interesting. Um, also, is it okay if I ask everyone where they're from? Before I tell my story. If you could write in the chat where you're from. France, wow. India, Canada, London, India, <laughs> Poland, Seattle, wow. Chicago, wow. Philippines, mm, wow. China, <laughs> Amazing. Okay. Yeah, Madrid. Keep going. Yeah. Wow. Delhi, India. And now I'm going to ask you just one more question before I tell you my story, because it's very relevant. Where are your parents from? Hmm. That, that soon Viviana is going to talk about um, anthrocentricity, and this is very hmm. relevant. Wow, south of China, South hmm. Africa. Hmm. The question is, where are your parents from? Mm. India. India, Nepal. Minnesota. Hi, Minnesota. <laughs> South Carolina. Hi, South Carolina. Poland. India. How impressive is that? Okay, so look how many different cultures we have here on this one conversation that we're having here. So I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about myself. Um, I'm a coach, I'm a master coach, and I'm a supervisor as well. I've worked really hard to get where I am. I worked for over 15 years in a large international organization, and we had a lot of cross-cultural blunders I don't want to say challenges. I'm going to say blunders. And when I first came to live here in Israel, I'm American. And when I first came to live here in Israel, I was in a high school where everyone spoke English. And everyone assumed that because we all came from English-speaking countries, we were all from the same culture. And that's what spiked my curiosity into this field. And since then, everything that I've done has had to do with cultures and cross-cultural. And so after I got my first certification as a coach, I went right into the cross-cultural and I started learning about what happens to us as a coach in the coaching arena itself. What is it that influences our coaching arena? What is it from my cultural identity? And what is it from my coachee's cultural identity that makes a difference even though the process is the same, and even though the levels of awareness are there, what big difference does it make? Today I work with startups and there's a huge cultural um, 
need for cultural sensitivity there especially. And I love what I do. Okay, back to you, Viviana. Okay, thanks, Karen. So now we are in 2005. I'm going to tell you briefly my story. In 2005, I just um, finished um, my Master in Human Rights Conflict Resolution and I wanted to find my first uh, job assignment. So one day I received an email from the United Nations saying, are you ready for an interview? And so um, I did my best. I prepared myself for the interview. I passed the interview. And the job was in West Africa, in Ivory Coast. And so um, I had to leave Italy and uh, I prepared you know, my luggage and then I was ready to land in Ivory Coast. So this is my journey from joy to frustration and then to coaching, which is happiness somehow for me. So in the, in the first picture, you see my son, I was so happy. I obtained this job, I was working for United Nations, moving to Africa, ready to meet beautiful colleagues all around the world. And so I was really excited. And then I arrived in Ivory Coast, and there um, I met my boss and then my colleagues. So we spent one week, the first week in a good hotel. We were connecting each other. And it was like a honeymoon in terms of relationship because everything was fine. And I was fascinated by them. They were fascinated by the whole thing. We like your accent. We like your way of dressing and so on. So everything was fine, but then the boss said, okay, now you're going to move in this city, in the, in the field, which is called Daloa, and then you're going to set up the office, and then you're going to start your work, and then, you know, we have thought so to, to do our job, you start to, from scratch, the relationship with the local authorities. Um, at the time, every cost was um, where um, there was a political turmoil, so the situation also was not easy. And we had to live all together. I think we were, yes, we were five, four from African, um, African countries, and I was the only European. So we had to live together under the same roof, literally. We had to rent a villa and we spent time together in the office and, and at home, and uh, sharing one car. And so the honeymoon ended quickly. So it was clear for me because I reached this level of frustration and we had a lot of um, conflict situations. And then I was like the lady in the picture, everything, you know, my excitement for this job, uh, I think uh, finished in two weeks because it was like uh, um, ending my energy. And this is how, um, I met coaching because at the time I didn't know a lot about coaching, but that's the reason I started to read on cross-cultural communication and then I led to coaching and then to cross-cultural coaching. So, um, first I want to give you more details what, um, regarding culture. So for me, culture is like an onion. So you should see culture at the, at the beginning, you will find external factors, which are languages, food, art, behavior, external behaviors, fashion also, and etiquette. You know, it was clear for me that my colleagues, they were not, um, I mean, appreciating a lot pasta. They, they were more looking for meat and very uh, good sauce and so on. So these are all external. They were speaking French with different accents. So these are all external factors and then you move um, as you you're going to to find internal factors which are norm values and then you discover also the basic assumptions which are um, I would say basic inclination to think to feel or to act in a way which is in somehow influenced by the culture so um, cultural identity for me it's like this book cocktail and somehow we all be, belong to different cultures and for me culture it's not only linked to national to our nations because we 
belong to different organizations, to different families and also corporations. So um, we should think at our Kochi, this is, this is how I think we should think at our Kochi as cocktail and also as, to us as coach to this beautiful um, cocktail of cultural orientation. This is also the reason why, for example, I'm Italian and if I'm going to do coaching and start coaching program with 10 different Italian coaches, uh, I will discover soon that they don't have the same cultural orientation because their experience, uh, each experience is different and each uh, coach uh, belongs to different uh, cultures. So now we are going to move and to see this four level um, awareness model. So um, please think about this four level awareness. Think, think about yourself, so your journey as coach, or you can think also about your coachee. Mm -hmm. So you as a coach and your coachee are going through these four different stages. So the first stage is like unconscious and competency. When you're going to meet a new culture or people belonging to different cultures, you are going to be in this state of mind, which is unconscious and competency. So you are still on this uh, way of thinking, you know, my way of um, reasoning, my opinion are Mm, the best one, I mean. And so you go through different stage. And the first, maybe Karen, I don't know if you want to, to add something regarding ethnocentrism, you go ahead huh? or just pop in whenever you find. Uh... Okay, so one thing I, I think that's important and you have it here in a really cute little picture. One thing that I found is that at first, we're really in denial, okay? We're really in denial that there is an issue there at all. And I think there's a West African saying that says we don't see things as they are, we see things as we are. And I, it, that, that I take when I teach cross-cultural, that's the, the, one of the starting points that we need to look at as we go forward, okay? We see things as we are, we see things through our focus and not through somebody else's focus. And I think the point of heterocentrism, uh, it's always a challenging word to say. What it really means is that it's, it's about the identity. It's about our identity and our personal identity. The reason I asked for where your parents were born is because it's not only the country that we live in now, but it's how we were raised and it's stronger than values. It's part of your identity. And when you realize that it's part of your own identity, and we need to do the work in the first step on our own identity and understanding what it is we were raised with and what things are very important to us culturally. Because when we meet in a coaching session with someone who has a different ethnic background, then we have to be surprised all the time is what I suggest. <laughs> so, um, thanks. So the first stage, it's when you deny. Okay, so you remember myself um, before leaving for every course, you know, I was worried about uh, my luggage, about my language skills. I um, was wondering if my French would be enough, but I was not thinking that cultural uh, could in somehow impact my performance. I have no clue about these cultural differences. So in the first stage, you deny. Uh, for example, as coach, you would think, you know, cultural uh, cannot impact my, my way of doing coaching. Maybe because I'm a accredited coach, so I know the procedure, I know the process, maybe cultural problem is not going to be an issue in my coaching practice. Um, I'm sure this is not the case between us today, but this could be uh, one case. So the second stage is when you see differences. The differences are in front of you, but you still you have this way of thinking, you know, it's not me, it's you. <laughs> and I have a very funny story regarding every course, because when um, 
we started to set up you know, the same team, you know, the four African, one European. Then we started to set up the office. And then our boss from HQ, they asked us to appoint one um, um, focal point in order to liaise with HQ. And so they were, um, we had a meeting and one colleague came to, um, to say, you know, I think that I should be the team leader because I'm older than you. And he was referring to me, you know, I have more experience than you. So at the time, I was in this second stage when I go back to my experience with um, um, and I think that I was in the second stage because I started to think why are you thinking like this I think that from my egalitarian point of view we should be you know you are, we have all the same job description so maybe we should do a rough or whatever but I don't, I, I, I really I genuinely thought that I was right, that, uh, you know, I got somehow offended that he wanted to be the team leader because he was older than me. So this is the second stage. Um, the fourth stage is when you do some downplay, which means that you are, for example, in a team, your coachee is in a team, or um, you are going to organize some coaching events, let's suppose, and then you find some common denominator, something that you have in common. Okay, let's maybe you are going to organize something with Coacheria. We are all uh, um, we share. We know that we share the same values, and so we don't think that we don't think that cultural issues will be cultural will be an issue because we share something. We have something in common. You know, like the tomatoes, that's why I put this tomato picture, because you uh, base everything on the uniformity and uh, you are confident that you have something in common and cultural differences will not uh, impact your practice, your communication style or whatever. So these are the three stages of unconscious incompetence. And then, you know, to move to the second stage, as long as you see the cultural differences, the conscious and competency stage is when you see differences, the differences are clear, are in front of you, you cannot uh, ignore anymore. And you start in somehow to open your hearts, but from the other side, your toolkit is still empty. So you don't know how to deal with these cultural differences because you have no maybe clue or maybe you don't have enough um, background or you didn't read uh, enough books or whatever. So at this stage you are able to recognize cultural differences and then you move through um, acceptation. You accept them like I did with my colleague who wanted to be the focal point at a certain point, you know, I said, okay, let's see what's going to happen. But, you know, I was still uh, not convinced 100% that his position was right, right. So when you accept someone else's position, it doesn't mean that you are going to surrender your ideas, your values, your cultural identity. You are just there, you accept, and um, you don't oppose them. Mm -hmm. Let's suppose, for example, that you are a coach and then uh, you have a coachee who uh, wants to do, um, who doesn't like to do coaching by um, Zoom. Maybe he prefers to do face-to-face. -face. So this is a way, uh, you know, you, you can accept his own preferences, although maybe you don't change this doesn't change your uh, cultural preferences, but you're going to accept and also to adapt. Mm -hmm. Regarding adaptation, for example, I have um, a lot of colleagues of mine in Africa, I have to say that they were uh, the particular concept of time and uh, time as plentiful. Uh, and so sometimes they were late. So I started also to adapt to this concept of uh, time as plentiful. And um, now I think this has a huge impact of my concept of time because I think that I'm starting to like this uh, cultural orientation of time and this is going <laughs> somehow to, to influence my um, story. So these are, Karel, please. Yeah, I'd like to add like a short example of a coaching 
and then how this can actually affect a coaching session. I took part in a project where I coached Orthodox, Orthodox women, right? Mm -hmm. it, from any faith, actually. And I have, uh, I work with money mindset a lot. And I have an exercise that I do. And one of the first question is, if money was a person, what would he look like? And how would he act? What would Mr. Money do? And I was coaching these very intelligent women who were right along in the process and they'd already identified their values and their judgments and they were right in the right place for this. And they came up with a blank, a total blank. They weren't able to answer the question. And they said, I don't understand. So I said, what would Mr. Money look like? And they looked at me, blank expression, no reaction whatsoever. And if I'm going to look at what you presented now, it's exactly this. My job was to recognize that there was an issue here. And there was something I wasn't understanding, that they needed me to help them to understand to move along. Hmm. So I recognized the problem. I accepted that this was a cultural issue. And I thought, quickly, how am I going to adapt? So I said, you know what? Let's try this one more time. If money were a person and the person's name was Mrs. Money, how, what would they look like and how would they react? And suddenly, everything freed up because in the ultra-Orthodox ultra -orthodox, um, culture, they're not allowed to have a relationship with another man except for their husband. So that I needed to react quickly, understand that this was a cultural issue and that it wasn't that they didn't understand. We live in the same country. You know, we speak the same language. So as a coach, it was a very aha moment for me. Mm. How we have to listen, how communication across cultures is so important. And when we deal with other countries, I have thousands of examples, but this is the one that came to my mind at this time. So Thanks. maybe you. Amazing, beautiful. So, and then we move to the third stage. This is called conscious competency. This is a beautiful space to stay, I have to say, because we are still uh, with the um, ethno-relativism approach. And here you start to do hard work on your cultural orientation. That means that you start to read books. Ram wrote a book also on um, cultural orientation. Karen, you wrote a book. And then uh, there are beautiful resources around on, the, on YouTube. And um, I'm sure that maybe Ram will suggest beautiful uh, um, resources. So you start to do your work on your cultural orientation regarding yourself like your personal cultural audit. You go back, you find like a list of cultural orientation and you do this cultural audit on yourself. Mm -hmm. Maybe you help your coach to do this cultural audit on himself or itself. And then you start to integrate and the cultural orientation. For example, now, uh, I have an example regarding one coachee. She is more, uh, she prefers to be direct in her communication. And she understood during the coach program that she needs to be uh, now more un indirect because the culture, the um, culture, the cultural environment of this um, work, um, um, working environment requires her to be somehow more indirect. So she's doing this work, but she's still, uh, so she's switching from directness to indirectness, but this work, this switching process is not automatic. It's not yet automatic because she's still thinking, you know? So we can help our coachee to do this switch, to follow you know, also this uh, switch um, and also, as coach, we can do this switch. So we are at this stage of conscious competency, and then we can move to the fourth stage, which is unconscious competency. Here, you know, you start to really leverage 
cultural component. You start to appreciate your own cultural components. Um, now, for example, I know that my cultural preference for time is plentiful and I really like to be like this because with some coaching, you know, I take my time for coaching sessions. But, you know, for other people, maybe they prefer to be more time, they're more time oriented, they have a different concept of time. So I started also to appreciate their own cultural orientation vis-a-vis -vis the time timing. So at this stage, you are doing to you are able to switch, you know, very automatically. You don't think about. You are able to recognize cultural components in your coaching very quickly. So you do an assessment in the environment, and you are able to recognize which cultural cultural orientation you should adopt and how you have to do this switch. And so, um, I mean, this is. A beautiful space to stay but I have to say that it's really difficult to keep this stage because once you reach this stage then you it's very easy to go back so you have to in somehow doing some exercise you have to keep um, alive your cultural awareness so I think Carol you have a beautiful example regarding your uh, coaching Russian coaching Mm, how you can stay on the fourth stage. Okay, so it, it's, you know, cultural sensitivity is an ongoing process. It's not something you reach, like you don't only reach level four, you have to keep developing as the levels of awareness, we have to keep up our thought process. And I think on a day-to-day -day basis, when I go into a coaching session, when I coach startups who are about to go to another country, I can always be surprised by the cultural influence that they have and their thought process. So here, for example, in Israel, you know, we are called the startup nation. So there are a lot of different startups. And the assumption that they have is that everyone should accept them the way they are. And they believe that everyone should accept everyone the way they are. But actually, we have to understand that people see things differently and there are different cultural orientations, as you said. And they have to learn to appreciate cultural orientations. So for example, I have a wonderful client who comes originally from Russia. And he has a very, very different paradigms than I've ever heard before. Um, they're shocking, some of them. And I realized when I go into the coaching session and these come up, I had to not look surprised, for example. Okay, somebody can say something to you and you really want to say back to them, you're not serious. You really didn't just say that. And it has nothing about to do with them being uneducated. We all think that we're very open-minded, but it comes from the anthrocentricity that complicates that. And then we have to take a step back. But I do have a really cute story about team coaching. So there were two teams, one American and one English. And you would think that they both speak the same language, that everything would be very, very simple. So towards the end of the day, um, the Americans said, let's table this issue. So everyone agreed. They went around the table. Do you agree to table this issue? And yes. And the Americans got up and left the room. And the people from England were shocked. They were insulted. Because in America, to table the issue means we're going to wait till tomorrow. Whereas in England, it means... We're gonna discuss this right now. We're gonna work until we solve the problem, okay? So they needed someone to help them through this process to learn that even though they both spoke the same language, it totally influenced the process of communication, which I believe is the big issue here is the communication. Thank you. Wow, thanks, Karen. So, yeah. It's our challenge as coach. I think that we should start to think where are, where are you on this journey? Where are we on this journey? Okay, are we at the first stage? Are we at the second stage or third 
the third or the fourth one. So um, you should think uh, which stage you have reached and then also you should start identifying the next developmental level. Mm? So this is how you can reach the fourth stage and then and hopefully you will stay in the fourth stage. So um, now I would like just to say that according to my experience, intercultural sensitivity, it's really important also to bolster core coaching competencies. Now I have to say that I'm a little bit more fresh on cultural, on coaching competencies, because this is the process I'm doing now to get PCC credentials. So I'm very stick on core competencies. And um, I have to say, for example, you know, trust. Uh, uh, for example, if you do a chemistry session and you are able to show that you are co cultural competent or even cultural intelligence even better, then the coachee, although maybe in the chemistry station the coachee is not aware of how the coaching process works, but I can tell you that the coachee is very, they can smell very easily if you are cultural uh, Com competent or intelligent. So this is something that can bolster trust between you and the potential coachee. And also, I think that cultural sensitivity can somehow bolster coaching presence and also active listening, because if you are observant there, you can listen and also understand the cultural components, orientation. And of course, you can challenge your coachee with power powerful questions and then of course you have direct communication that means that you have the chance to share feedback comments and so on you open the, the gate and also to create uh, an amazing awareness and so this is the way i see and i'm sure priya maybe you're going to add something but this is the way also in this how cultural sensitivity can bolster coaching competencies in every niche single coaching service. Although if you don't go through a cultural audit or to a team or also a one-to-one -one cultural audit, this is the way you can use cultural sensitivity in your single uh, coaching sessions with every coaching every day. So Karen, please go, go ahead. I know that you want to share something on this. Okay, can you, can you just push the next slide? Sure. Okay, so this is my theory on what happens when we meet someone from another culture. Actually, it happens to us when we go to the coffee house down the road. The first thing that happens to us is that we jump to assumptions, assume. <clears throat> and right after we assume, we compare. We're going to compare our experience to a, um, a previous experience. <laughs> Excuse me. For example, if you go to the coffee house, you'll expect to have a place to sit at the table. And you'll expect to have the, the level of service that you had before or a better level of service. And that's the compare and then we're going to expect. And right away we judge. And it's a split second thing that happens. <laughs> Working with teams and working with people from different cultures, we do this in a very, very strong way. We get on an airplane and we fly to another country. And I was surprised by how few people actually read up on the cultures, read up on body language, read up on communication styles. And instead what we do is we assume Right. Let's say I went to China today and I don't know anything about body language in China. I could actually do something that would, that's a taboo in, in a culture that I don't, haven't studied. And I'll compare it to my culture and I'll expect the same reaction. I'll, ex, I'll compare my communication style to their communication style. I'll expect them to answer me the way that I want to, and then automatically I'll come up with a judgment. Okay, and I found that in cross cultural coaching, the first thing we need to do is change the assumption, okay, or to be without an assumption, mm -hmm. allow myself to be surprised. And when I'm at that place where I let the assumption go and allow myself 
to communicate and to have active listening, everything changes automatically. So Priya, if you could pull up the next slide, please. Thank you. So we hear what we know. So when we're listening, we need to listen differently. For example, for example, when I first met Ram, I, I said to myself, I'm gonna, I'm going to hear what he knows and not hear what I know. When I met Viviana, I reminded myself, hear what Viviana knows and not what I know. And that allows us as coaches to develop another sense of awareness, a super awareness and a super super awareness of listening and listening across cultures. And the next one, the next one. Viviana, can you move to the next slide, please? Thank you. Okay. So this, I really believe, are the seven keys to coaching communication across cultures. Be aware of the differences. Know before you go in that there are going to be differences. Be willing to learn, because I believe it's about learning, accepting, and respecting. Be willing to learn. Be willing to listen. Be willing to hear. Be willing to adapt. Be willing to integrate your coaching systems that you have in place, that you've learned, that you've studied, and integrate those in a very different way. And be willing to accept, because I'm sure that we all think that we're very open-minded, and I believe that we are, and but we still have those assumptions. So take those assumptions, take these seven keys, go into that coaching session, go into that working with teams and organizations with these seven keys, and you'll be surprised how much you learn. It's an amazing world. And that's it from my part. Yeah, if I can just <laughs> jump in here a little bit. Yes. Um, I have earlier mentioned some of the very well-known cultural models. I know that Viviana has done a lot of work on Rosinski. <clears throat> Carolyn and I had discussed earlier People like Shine, Hofstede, uh, Fons Trompeners, who I think both of us listened to when he came and spoke at the EMCC conference, uh, yeah. and uh, the Globe model, which is very clear. Now, look at it this way. If you have had any experience working or coaching, doesn't matter what, with different cultures, let us look at the Eastern and the Western culture as a generalization, which is never true specifically. But if you take, for example, the Japanese or the Chinese culture versus perhaps the Dutch or the American culture, you would find typically the Asian cultures are indirect, oblique, elliptical. The Western cultures are far more uh, direct. And Viviana mentioned that when she went, somebody said about I'm older and therefore I should be the team leader. And in Hofstede's model, six or seven, I, I'm not quite sure how many numbers, one of the main cultural differences that he tells us that we should appreciate is what is called the power distance. How are the hierarchical differentiations that are made? Am I older and therefore what I am? And so on and so forth. And also about masculine femininity. If I'm masculine, I'm superior and therefore. And of course, women today would rebel against it, but even in the United States where equality is supposed to be so common, there's a huge issue of confidence gap. Magda and I discuss this all the time. What is it that we can do as coaches to completely uh, eliminate that uh, stuff? Collectivism versus individualism, another one. If you look at the Asian cultures, they are very, very collected. Uh, they would like to take decisions by consensus, the Ringi model of <clears throat> Japan versus the very individualistic style of Americans and so on. Short term versus long term. Uh, many of the Asian cultures would look at things in a much longer term than cultures in the West, which are much shorter term. All these are reflected in the way clients look at things. And so if we come from, let's say, one culture or the other, and the client comes from another culture, uh, like what both Viviana and Carol said earlier, are we able to subsume our judgment, what Otto Sharma calls the first level of horrible listening, where you're only thinking about what you know, your selective judgmental listening. And at least at the very least level, go into curious listening about what the other person is thinking about, which is the conscious incompetent level, and then into the empathetic level, 
which is the conscious competence level, and finally, the fantastic unconscious competence level, which is a generative listening. And beautifully, Otto Sharma's model of four levels of listening will fit in there. A couple of examples I just would like to give you. Um, Hofstede did a lot of work in IBM. He worked with almost uh, several tens of thousands of people. And then Fons Frampener did a lot of work with Shell. There's a very famous, and there's a YouTube um, uh, video of uh, Fon. It's pronounced as F-O-N-S. Trompenars I have spelled out here, T-R-O-M-P-E-N-A-A-R-S. You can just Google that video. It's an amazing video, and he's a fantastic speaker. He did this uh, study where he posed a question. You are sitting as a passenger in a car. Your friend is driving, and the friend has had a few drinks, maybe one too many. And he hits a pedestrian. He doesn't say what happens to the pedestrian. And so he's taken by the police, and they are questioning, and you're asked to come to the court to testify. And the friend wants, it, wants you to testify saying that he was not drunk, that he was completely sober, and he had never had a drink. So what would you say? It is not as simple as it looks. And, and the answers were so radically different. There are many cultures. I'm not just talking about Eastern cultures, Western cultures, South European cultures, where they said, a friend is a friend. I have to stand by the friend till death. And therefore, if the friend wants me to tell the police or the court that I'm not drunk, I will say that he is not drunk. And there were many other cultures where they said, no, truth is the truth. And therefore, I have to say what is true. Completely ignoring the fact there is no such thing as truth. Truth is a lie. What you see and what you filter in your mind, like a neuro-linguistic programming would say, your perception is your truth. It's not the reality which is the truth. So where does the real truth lie? In the Eastern culture, we look at it very, very differently. Our Vedas say that there are, there may be one truth, but there are multiple pathways to that truth. And each one of us perceive that truth in different frames, in different lenses. And that is really where the beauty of culture lies and which is where the difficulty of culture lies, the differences. So some of my very early experiences, when I worked a lot with Japanese, for example, when they, you hear them say, yes, hi, hi, is what they say, and you take it at face value saying they are saying yes to you, you're going to be in for a root shock. All that they are saying by saying yes is that I understand what you're saying. And the next morning when they come back, they might refute every single thing that you have said. And there are Americans who would go to meetings in Japan or China, I've, I've been with them, where they fly in the morning and they would like to wrap up and go back with a contract in the evening. Whereas the Japanese and the Chinese in Asia, they want to just build a relationship. They need to spend at least a week with you before they decide that they are good enough to sign a contract with. So there's a huge differentiation and the same thing applies between coaches and clients. Some may uh, agree with this, some may not agree with this, but this has been my experience. So some of you may have questions and I would like Carol and Viviana to answer this and many of you to share what your points of view are. Thank you. So if I may just uh, come in, um, I've had uh, two small experiences that, I, that I'd like to share. One is um, when I worked with a group of leaders from Manila, um, I had faced some challenges when they wouldn't take action on what they had committed to. And this was getting to be a pattern that I was seeing. And um, it was what Viviana shared. I, I did not understand this until I made, I, it became aware to me that they were struggling with the fact that they needed permission to get moving. That was, that was the pattern and that was how they were thinking. And once I understood that, I was able to make that switch to say, okay, they need that much time. They need to give themselves permission or get permission from somebody else in the organization to be able to move forward. So this was um, you know, being aware and being sensitive to that. I was fortunate because there were 
eight of them I was working with and I was seeing this as a pattern. But this could have been missed had I just dealt with one uh, client. Uh, so it was an interesting learning uh, for me regarding that. Um, the second thing I wanted to share was also that now I understand that we look at culture not just as a country, a nation, but in organizations, in family systems. Um, anywhere there's a group of people who've worked together in similar situations, a culture gets formed. And I'm also beginning to think perhaps some of the belief systems come from these cultural differences. And that's something that as coaches, I'd like to always keep in mind when I'm talking to a coachee. So this is what I had to offer. Um, uh, I'd like to hear from others, any comments, any questions for, the, um, for Carol and Viviana? <clears throat> Yeah, as of now, there aren't any questions. Carol and Viviana, if you want to share some other stuff, especially one of the things that fascinate me on, fascinate me is that uh, when we talk about cultural differences between large regions, if, for example, you get those people from the same region coming together, then you find subcultural differences. Mm -hmm. And within that, if you have, you have subcultural differences. For example, if India and Pakistan were to be a cricket match, you would have probably mayhem and murder. But within India, if they play, they would be, again, between the different regions. Or within the region, there is going to be. I think the culture is never going, the cultural differences are never going to desert us. It's always going to be there. It's a question of how we open up and we have that antenna open to appreciate the other person's perspective, almost like a perceptual position model in NLP or the empty chair model in Gestalt, if we are able to do that. I think that, that, that is, yeah, somebody said cultures, exist within cultures, absolutely, subcultures and sub-subcultures and so on yes. and so forth. Yeah, Carol and Viviana, your perspectives, please. Yeah, yeah, Viviana, you are here. <clears throat> you. I go. Yes. I go, Carol, and then, yep. okay. Yes. Yeah, it's true. I'm, I'm really surprised because at the beginning, you know, when I got fascinated with cross-cultural coaching, I was thinking, okay, my, my clients, you know, will be also people moving around the world, but then, okay, these are part of my clients, but then I started to do, you know, also coaching to Italians who has nothing to do with the cult in international settings, environments. And then I discovered that also in, with these people and this kind of coaching who has a orient cultural orientation, I was supposed to think very similar to me. Uh, cultural orientation makes difference. For example, I work with a couple, a wife and a husband, and they have a very different cultural orientation regarding the past, uh, the present and the future, because they, they belong to the same internal culture, but for example, the wife is more future oriented. The husband is more uh, present oriented. That means that, for example, the, the husband wants to go around and to really enjoy life without thinking too much to future projects, while the, the wife is more, uh, you know, future oriented. So this is, uh, this is something they, they became aware during the coaching program. And this is why they're trying to switch uh, the husband uh, is trying to, for example, to appreciate the future oriented orientation of the wife and the wife is trying to appreciate the present orientation. And this is going to somehow to improve also the communication between the them, between them, you know? So this, I'm really fascinated because I'm starting to really to discover a lot of things and I'm so, so happy. So I will leave now to Karel. Thanks, Viviana. That's an amazing story. And, and you know, one of the things you, you could ask them as well is where do their parents originally come from? Where does the family, where's the basis of their family comes from? And that'll help you as a coach recognize the different levels of, is it a high level or is it a low level um, culture? there at the same time. And uh, when we first met, I told you about this exercise and I actually did it in a different, um, for a different reason altogether. And it was an exercise that someone had given me to do. And it works really well with cultures. And you take two people from different cultures and give them 
um, all of the details of what they would need to build a house. Okay, so let's say the house. Um, for me, it's very important to have central heating and central air conditioning, all right? To have an American kitchen, okay? To have a lot of light from the outside. Whereas the person that I was working with, it was very important for them, all right, to have a pantry. And we went through this exercise, you know, and it started a discussion how, what's important to you and what's important to me. And the second stage of this exercise, the facilitator actually invites each two people, each team up to choose a little note. And on the note, it's how much money they have to build the house. And then we have to see what I'm willing to give up and what he was willing to give up. Okay, as we were working. And there are a lot of cultural connotations here. And we ended up with a seven room house with an American kitchen, a huge pantry, um, central heating, central air conditioning, and only mattresses we see. We didn't have enough money left for furniture. <laughs> and it's a wonderful exercise that you can do with people who come from different cultures. Because then they start to understand while we really come from different places, different things are important to us, and then to approach this in that way. So that's, that's my perspective. My perspective is always first learn and then accept the differences between us. And then the next stage is to accept so that we can move forward. Jenna, I just want uh, to pose a question to you in the last couple of minutes that we have left. Um, we talk about cultures and so on. We know that, and, and essentially we talk about cultural differences, diversity. We know if we are honest with ourselves, even within siblings, even within twins, there are differences. Okay. Yes. So uh, they're not, they not in any sense of the term cultural from the standard definition of culture. They come from the same family, same probably upbringing, conditioning, blah, 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 all that kind of a stuff. So where does this assumption of cultural differences stop? And where does the acceptance that human beings as we are will always be different? We'll always be different. We'll always, you know, it's like when we have a, a pattern that we change as, you know, as we're coached as we do ever, the patterns don't disappear, right? We put them to bed, okay? Mm -hmm. We let them, but they will come up again and again in different forms, <coughs> right? Um, for example, I'm what I call um, a recovering perfectionist, okay? And I say recovering because it's always there and it's something that I'll always deal with. So even if we have twins in the same family and they have, one of them will connect more through their value system to a certain part of cultural identity and the other through their own individual value system will connect to another part of their cultural identity. Is that, does that make sense? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I, I just wanted to throw it as an existential question. Uh, uh, where does it, okay, anyway, um, we are almost on top of the, uh, Magda, would you like to come in and share the password before we formally close and thank uh, Vivian? Sure. Early. Yeah, please. Yeah, the password is Brazil. I'm going to write it down here too, Brazil. Um, so everyone who wants to claim, you will get an email confirmation um, to tell you how to do this um, but I'm just typing something in so coach aria.thinkific.com is the website where you go to claim once you go there click on today's session and you will be asked a question which is where you enter the password make sure that once you answer the question you click confirm and next, so that um, you actually get to the screen where your certificate displayed because quite a few of you emailed me before saying that you didn't see it. Um, I promise you it's gonna work, but make sure you follow the steps. So again, cocharia.thinkific.com, select today's webinar and that the password is Brazil. 
Thanks, Manka, and thank you, uh, Viviana and Carol, for a wonderful session. Tremendous learning. Thanks for Priya uh, for putting it this together. You were the one who brought Viviana here, and I think you are now becoming an expert on globally diverse coaching and <laughs> engineering. Okay, all the best, and all of you. Good night. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.